Hello, and welcome to the Carbon Farming Panel for uh, UNC's Clean Tech um, webinar. And today we're going to talk about uh, carbon farming. My name is Christine Morgan, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at the Soil Health Institute. Uh, to start out today, I want to uh, begin with a little bit of housekeeping. I'd like to remind you all that this panel is being recorded. And at the end of the panel discussion today, you will be provided a link uh, to this panel, a recording of this panel on YouTube. Um, as far as questions go, we're going to start out with some introductions and we're going to transition into a few specific questions and have the panel answer all of those questions. And then as we go through these questions, we'd appreciate if you would want to ask a question at the end of that. Uh, at the bottom of your Zoom participant um, window, if you click on the icon that says Q&A, uh, you can type in a question and we will look to that panel uh, for questions at the end. Please go ahead and type in your question when you have it. Uh, please don't wait to the end because uh, we can see those questions live as they come up and um, start to plan on which questions to answer and you know, just kind of look at the timing details of everything. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Christine Morgan and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at the Soil Health Institute. And um, I'm beaming in from the Research Triangle Park area of North Carolina. And uh, I would say, I'm introduce myself, I'm a soil scientist and I've been the Chief Scientific Officer at SHI for about a year. Uh, prior to that, I was a research and teaching professor at Texas A&M University, and there I worked a lot in um, soil hydrology associated with um, adoption of soil health management practices, and primarily also worked in vision ag and also developing tools to uh, quickly map soil properties. So that's really my tie to this carbon farming panel is I've been a researcher that works on technologies to get um, the ability to map soil carbon much lower so that we can quantify it for something like a car carbon farming economy. Um, with that, uh, stop my introduction and go ahead and define uh, carbon farming. Uh, so I just looked it up on the internet to get you a, a, an exact one, but I, I'm not gonna read it uh, essentially the main idea of carbon farming is, is managing your soil so that your soil becomes more of a sink of carbon than a net output of carbon into the environment. So we're getting the CO2 from the atmosphere saved into the soil. Um, so it involves implementing practices that are known to improve the rate at which carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere and converted to plant material or organic matter actually in the soil. And, um, you know, that's really important. You know, ca carbon farming is uh, primarily driven by the concept that we can mitigate climate change uh, by increasing the amount of uh, carbon in the soil. Soil is the largest terrestrial sink of carbon. Um, so it's, it's a great place to, to get a little extra carbon out of the atmosphere. But there's also other reasons why we want to farm for carbon. Um, carbon not only helps with climate change mitigation, but also with adaptation from climate change. You know, we have these global existential challenges in front of us as a society around water, food, and energy security, biodiversity, and human health. And they're all associated with carbon farming because when we put more carbon into our soils, it provides many ecosystem benefits that affect these global existential challenges. For example, improving carbon in our soils help with water cycling in soils, with nutrient cycling. So a lot of that lends to water quality and water quantity. As we increase carbon in our soils, it affects our ecosystem um, and our, our biology in our soils. And a lot of, of, of increasing carbon also aids in drought resilience and also extreme weather resilience or extreme rainfall resilience which gets back to that climate change, um, this adaptation to climate change, especially in agriculture. Um, so that's the introduction of the big picture today. And with that, I would like to introduce the panel. Uh, and each panelist will be introducing themselves, but we'll start with Hugh McGilvery. Hugh, would you like to go, so go ahead? 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Christine. I'm Hugh McGilvery. Uh, I am the uh, I head up the commercial business for a new company called Anuvia Plant Nutrients. And what we do is we uh, manufacture bio-based nutrition, which I think supports the premise of uh, carbon farming. Uh, my background has been in agriculture my entire career. Uh, I'm actually a Canadian, was educated in Canada, spent my first 10 years there working in the egg industry, went to Europe, spent some time in Europe, and I've been in the US uh, since 97, working in the biotech seed, um, crop protection and, and fertility spaces. Great. Um, this is Mark Tracy. Um, it's a pleasure to be on the panel today. I spent most of my career, um, almost 20 years, in a variety of leadership roles with Cargill Inc., one of the largest food companies um, in the world. Most recently, I was on the leadership team for Indigo Agriculture. Uh, it was the digital disruptor to big food. And now my current role is as CEO of Cloud Agronomics. Um, it's interesting, some of you may be aware, Indigo has been a leader in um, taking a leadership role in promoting carbon farming and carbon sequestration in farmland. Uh, made an announcement last spring that they were going to start incentivizing farmers to pay them on a per acre basis to adopt regenerative practices. In the interim between the time that this uh, panel was originally scheduled for in-person till today, Cargill has also introduced a program to do the same. So both of my former institutions are actively involved in incentivizing carbon farming. Uh, my role currently at Cloud Agronomics is going to play a very important role, we believe, in enabling this voluntary carbon credit market, which um, one of the beauties of carbon farming is the potential for scale because we have farmland across the globe. And we obviously have a very large problem that we need to address in climate change. And we can use proven technology, in this case photosynthesis, to help reverse those effects. But one of the challenges is actually verifying how much carbon is in soil today and monitoring those changes over time in a scientifically rigorous way. At Cloud Agronomics, we use something called hyperspectral imaging, which allows us to remote sense the health of plant and soil. Um, so we can almost act as a CT scan for plants in real time. And we are proving our ability right now in conjunction with Indigo Ag to demonstrate um, the ability to remote sense the amount of carbon in topsoils today. Hi, I'm, I'm Alden Donnelly. I'm called the Director of Carbon Economics for a Seattle-based startup called Nori. Um, we're building what we're calling a dedicated carbon removal marketplace. So we want to create a market in which there we're fostering um, su supply and demand um, of certificates that represent one ton withdrawn from the atmosphere and retained in a terrestrial in terrestrial storage. And our priority or our first um, uh, class of projects we want to we want to support our um, our regenerative uh, food and fiber production practices. Um, I'm another Canadian. Uh, I um, started working in this space coming at it from a large energy company perspective in the 1990s. Uh, in 1999, on behalf of a consortium of large ener energy companies, I, I brought together, I signed a contract to buy over a 10 year term, a minimum of 2.8 and a maximum of 10 million um, carbon offset credits from 137 farmers in Iowa, Indiana, and Illinois. Um, the group I was representing also funded the first round of uh, uh, the first round of the of major science that still to this day informs uh, soil organic carbon stock and stock change estimation methods, both 
as those estimates are developed in models and in soil sample testing labs. Uh, for many reasons that uh, uh, that ag soil carbon market that we were confident was going to bloom back in the early 2000s uh, went sideways on us and uh, Nori's been in existence for just under three years because we think the time is right to get it right now. So I'm really excited about these discussions. Thank you. And I'm Matt Russell. I wear a couple of hats. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, my hometown on the main street in front of the library trying to grab the um, the public Wi-Fi from the library, but opting for my cell phone hotspot because that's down and on my farm, our internet today is not up to speed for the first time. So good timing. Um, so that's why I'm in my car. I farm with my husband. Uh, we do 110 acres of uh, kind of all regenerative agriculture, all retail agriculture, cattle, grass finished beef, produce. I grew up on a commodity farm, a uh, thousand acre farm through the 70s and 80s into the 90s. Um, served eight years on the Farm Service Agency State Committee uh, back in Obama in the first year of the Trump administration. And then I'm also the executive director for Iowa Interfaith Power and Light. And uh, so we're a faith-based organization working uh, empowering Iowans to take bold and just action on climate change. And one of the most important things we can do politically uh, from our faith, from our capacity is to empower Iowa farmers to lead on, on climate action. And that is twofold, um, reducing emissions and capturing carbon. And we call that carbon farming. So when, you, when we look at agriculture as a solution to the climate crisis, developing agricultural systems that uh, do both of those things, reduce emissions and uh, sequester carbon. That's really what the IPCC Special Land Use Report has been saying. I mean, the IPCC has been saying most recently in the Special Land Use Report. So we've been inviting farmers into church basements to lead on developing a message uh, to get past the politics, to get farmers uh, unleashed. And the position of farmers is, is that w for carbon farming, we are small businesses, we are innovators, and the most important part of that innovation that's going to happen has to be led by farmers, has to be developed by farmers. It's not simply just purchasing a product up the supply chain, it's actually integrating set of practice areas, um, not only innovating within them, but innovating in how they interact, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Thanks. So that's fantastic. Uh, thank you, Matt, because the, you created a wonderful segue to our first question. So a little background is we know that, um, you know, to, for carbon farming to take off in the United States, especially, um, we have a big change that has to be made and that's changing uh, practices so that, you know, farmers deciding to uh, take the practices that they know well and altering them to, uh, do things like cover cropping and reduce their tillage and, and have more rotations and greater diversity to um, increase the carbon in their soils. And so with that comes a lot of challenges. You know, there's a lot of perceived risk, right? There's economic challenges, technological challenges, you know, as Mark talked about how you measure that carbon inexpensively, and then social challenges, you know, how do you get over that leap of um, you know, we do things one way and now it's time to do something different. And that gets to the first question. The first area that we wanted to talk about is that sociology of carbon farming. And so the question that I have is that assuming that technical advances exist uh, so that the adoption of carbon farming practices is, is economical and um, can be value driven and not technologically driven, um, how do each of you uh, respond to, you know, your experiences of adoption outside of, you know, the technical driven space? Like, you know, what, what, is the, what are the social concerns or the social barriers to adoption of carbon farming practices? And we'll start with Mark. Yeah, thank you. So I think it's a really important question. That's the type of question that often gets overlooked, unfortunately. And, you know, as Matt rightly points out, this is where, this is the front lines of the implementation of what we're doing is at the farm. So the incentives have to be aligned properly for the farmer, I think, first and foremost. Um, we can talk a little bit more about this later, and I hope that government will 
help play a role in, in facilitating that. Um, I think we are fortunate to have pioneers like Matt and other farmers who have adopted regenerative practices over the past decade, some even prior to that, who have demonstrated that longer term, ultimately this improves the profitability of a farm by improving the quality of the soil and the soil health. Um, probably some of our attendees didn't know they were going to be talking about or hearing about soil today. Um, but this is a really important part of what we're trying to do. Um, probably some of you are not aware of how expensive the chemical inputs are for farmers today in terms of fertilizer and, and other chemical ingredients that need to be applied in traditional commodity farms. And the ability of using some of these regenerative practices to improve that soil health dramatically reduces the amount of those chemicals that need to be applied, um, which really impacts the bottom line dramatically. Now, I think one of the challenges is that there are a couple years potentially in between the adoption of those practices and starting to feel some of those economic benefits. And that's where companies like Indigo and Cargill are proposing front-loading some payment to incentivize farmers and assist them getting through that gap period. But that's another place, as I mentioned before, where I think uh, government could play a role to help. Alden? Um when it comes to barriers, and I, and, I, and I have to make sure everybody understands, I, I am not um, a, a farmer. <laughs> and I know very little bit about producing food and fiber. But uh, we started uh, mobilizing investment in what we called in those days conservation credits in um, central Canada in the late 1990s. And when we started, it would probably have been fair, fair to say that maybe 10, 15% of the acreage in the middle prairies were um, in some form of conservation or regenerative practice or starting the transition. And today they're at about 55%. So that's quite a bit of progress. When we were working hard at making that progress, uh, from my perspective, maybe not from a farmer's perspective, the, the, the largest barriers to moving forward um, seemed to be the following. And I, I, I think we're seeing that again in the United States. First of all, um, I and, and, and some of the, the entities that are willing to invest tend to be thinking about climate change mitigation and food producers, fiber producers are rightly, um, and this shouldn't change, focused on uh, soil health. So one of the things we do is we just speak the wrong language and we need to get over that and focus on soil health because there's almost a perfect correlation between increasing soil health and adopting practices that are going to draw down and sequester carbon. The other thing, the next thing that surprised me um, is uh, when a grower goes from monocrop to multiple crop rotations and cover crops, uh, I wasn't ready for the fact that the distribution, the traditional distribution system isn't ready for that. Um, and I, I wasn't ready. I, I would argue that probably was the single largest and continues to be in places that we move around the single largest um, uh, uh, problem. You know, it, it, it's, it's great to talk about uh, two and three crop rotations and cover crops. But if the distribution channel the producer is used to working with isn't, isn't suited to managing that, that whole different pattern of deliveries to market, it can be a huge, huge challenge. And I have to admit, I, I did not anticipate that one at all. Um, the second thing is, to be frank, um, we've had, I would argue, three, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm afraid to say, might be looking at the fifth false start on carbon markets. And no uh, food or fiber producer should adopt a practice change without more certainty that there will be um, uh, revenue in it for them than they've had of late. Now we, ho we, we hope to be part of the process of addressing that, um, that issue. We think it can be done. And just uh, looking back at the Canadian history that informs what uh, um, I'm trying to be part of in the United States, 
um, as a result of, of, of some of our efforts and efforts of others, certainly not, not just, not just um, things I was involved in. Uh, uh, a carbon offset market was launched in Alberta in 2005, which still exists. That's a small, uh, relatively small geography with only about three and a half million people. Um, and to date, the energy market has paid farmers who have adopted conservation project, pros, uh, pro projects uh, for more than 13.7 million offset credits um, at prices uh, before deductions uh, ranging between 12 and $33 a ton. Um, I, 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 I think there are both great, um, uh, there's very, very, a lot, great deal of experience to draw from the um, Alberta market history, both positive and negative, but um, uh, there is a significant market operating just north of us, and it'd be really, really nice to get the U.S. version of that ruling as soon as possible. Okay, and um, Matt. Yeah, this is a great a great question, and we've done a lot. We, we, we anticipated our work. We've been doing this for a little over two years when I started leading Iowa Interfaith Power and Light. So the first is kind of the political landscape, and that is that, you know, climate change is, is politically divisive, and farmers have been kind of organized around the last few years. Two, two forces. One is the anti-regulatory climate skeptic. Um, if we engage on climate change, we're going to be regulated out of existence. Lots of resources, a little bit more conservative uh, end of the political spectrum. And on the environmental side, a little more of the progressive end of the spectrum. Lots of resources around how farmers are, you know, agriculture is causing climate change. So 25% of, of climate change, you know, global warming about is attributed to agriculture in some, some uh, studies. So that's the two places that farmers have been invited to engage, um, either accept the fact that we're causing all the problems or get into kind of a political uh, stance of we got to avoid talking about climate change or we're going to be overregulated. And I knew that wasn't where farmers were at because I'm a farmer and I talk to farmers. I've since generation Iowa farmer been doing farm myself for 15 years and uh, on my own and farm policy and research work for 20 years here in Iowa. So I knew farmers were interested in having a different conversation and that's what we've teed up is inviting farmers to talk to each other about how they see the problem of climate change, how they see their vocation as a farmer and then how, do, how, how does their identity as a farmer connect to this really big problem. And what they did is they developed a conversation where it's like, yeah, climate change is a big problem. We solve problems, that's who we are as farmers. And we need to lead in action and part of that is changing the economics. And so that's the second piece in terms of environmental services on farms that our farmers in these discussions really heat up and talked about was, and we targeted farmers that were high conservation minded farmers, Republican farmers, Democratic farmers, 6,000 acre corn and soybean farmers, 600 head cattle operations, a few CSA farmers, right? It was like the whole spectrum in these conversations. And to a person, what they did, talked about is that if they put high conservation uh, practices on their farm, so regenerative agriculture, they put that on their farm, they take a greater risk for making that investment and uh, then their neighbors who aren't. And the cost of that is all internalized to them and where their neighbor can take the shortcuts. And so the economics are exactly upside down. And so that's the starting place that we're redefining the politics around this. It's, this is a problem that, that farmers can solve and farmers at our core are problem solvers. We wake up in the morning and, and we've got a thousand problems that have to be solved. And it's part, it's part of our DNA. So we're great at solving problems, big problem needs solved. And then how do we change the economics? So, you know, we don't do policy work. We don't do practice work necessarily. We're doing conversation, narrative, worldview uh, how do we position farmers to be part of this solution? And that is we're, we're innovators, we're problem solvers, we've got to change the economics. And, and not just the long-term economics, but short-term economics. So when I put these practices on my farm, five, 10 years, I can see benefits. 
but we've got to change the economics so that as soon as I'm producing public benefits, that I, there's there's a value that can determine what that is, and that I can actually internalize that into my operation. And that'll do two things. One is it creates a revenue stream that rewards me for doing what the world needs. And then to Mark's point, what the, the two for there is that if I'm doing it really well, I'm eliminating inputs. So I'm reducing my costs. But we have to have both. We have to have payments and reduced costs. We can't just do this all on reduced costs. Thank you. Uh, Hugh, would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, sure. I think I think um, I agree with uh, most of the comments that were made. I think that the challenge for farmers a lot of times comes down to economics. I think most farmers, they're landholders, they're farming, they're pragmatic, um, but at the end of the day, that's their livelihood and they're looking for uh, strategies that drive better economics for them. And so when you look at what we do, we create uh, bio-based plant nutrition. Um, we're recycling, returning uh, organic matter back to the soil in that strategy. So our products return about 16% organic matter back. Uh, we've been at this for about three years now. And uh, in essence, we're addressing a number of the, the things that are being talked about, returning carbon to the soil. And we're on about 1.2 million acres. We've returned um, about 11 million uh, pounds of carbon back to the soil in that period of time. By doing that, we're feeding the soil, we're feeding the microbes in the soil, which re returns and creates uh, organic matter ultimately in the soil. And that is part of the sequestration uh, process. Uh, I think that, that what farmers need are, are tools to be able to deliver the things that the marketplace wants, i.e. reduce greenhouse gases, uh, improve soil health. Uh, and so what we're doing in combination with what the other folks are doing in terms of measuring carbon, and paying credits on carbon, we're providing a tool for farmers to enhance their soil health, uh, improve uh, carbon in their soil, and reduce greenhouse gases in that strategy. So in essence, we're giving a tool that actually is profitable for the grower while helping them uh, meet some of the challenges that are being asked to meet. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go to the second question, um, I wanted to circle back on the distribution component because we have quite a few questions coming up on that. And first, I would say that um, I've heard much the same thing. When I started at the Soil Health Institute, I started meeting farmers um, that would talk about this, this distribution question and even a market question. For instance, um, I was surprised to hear that some farmers that were highly committed to soil health practices and improving their soil health were actually um, had gone to organic and they hadn't gone to organic practices simply because um, they found it you know they thought oh this is a profitable way to go or I, I have a strong ideology about organic it was about wanting to use soil health management practices but needing um, markets access to markets um, for diversification so uh, I see a lot of nodding so I think we'll start with you again, Alden. Um, there's a question from the audience that says, please provide some examples of how the traditional distribution system is not ready for regenerative practices. Well, um, maybe to illustrate, and, and we're, we're, we're committed to working with a, a, a demonstration project if it proceeds in Tennessee to help with this. You know, it's fine for all of us really smart people to go out and say, gee, you know, great, you're, you, 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 you've, you've got your cotton soy rotation happening and now let's, now let's talk about cover crops. And the guy looks at you and says, well, you know, but when I plant my cover crops and if they're, you know, uh, actual cash crops, to, it'll cost me more in fuel and time and fees to get that crop to market than I'm getting in all of the return that I might get even monetizing the carbon sequestration from using the cover crops. Um, so, and he's right. So, you know, what do you say? Um, so, so 
where we've seen um, these kinds of practices really, really start to take off, it is when there's, um, quite frankly, a lot of cooperation within a region and a community. And the movement towards regenerative ag and, um, and soil health seems to coincide with um, a whole bunch of other initiatives that make that that address the distribution challenge and some of those initiatives are just organic uh, in you know local markets uh, local schools and hospitals decide to start buying more food locally or more more supplies locally or it can be um, um, very intentional and 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 built at the large scale but uh, as I said, I, I, I kind of focus on that one because that was the barrier I, I have, I've not been ready for. And it's the, still the biggest barrier I see in different locations. And it's hard because the right solution is different for every set of circumstances, in my experience. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I saw you nodding a lot when I started talking about um, diversity and, and market. Would you like to make a comment or expand on that concept? Yeah, uh, real quick, the way we look at, as a farmer, the way I look at what are the practice areas for regenerative agriculture, they're going to have the highest environmental benefits focused on climate, both resilience and mitigation. And, and the first is on-farm energy production. How are we as farmers going to innovate around that? And we have. We, Iowa, we developed, we were part of the developing the wind industry, obviously the ethanol industry. We've got folks working on methane digesters. We have the pork producers to fend solar. I mean, we know how to do energy generation on our farms. Um, we have to do conservation tillage. We have to do um, integrating livestock. So instead of having silo production of uh, livestock here, crops here, we have to integrate those grazing. Managed grazing system in dairy is like the one that most people understand. But you also have to look at you know the, the animal feeding operations and nutrient management and stuff. And then. Um, something growing all the time, which is cover crops, but also other kinds of crops are something always growing. And then the fifth one is expanding our crop rotations. So in all of those areas, we as farmers have to innovate. How can we, you know, expand the crop rotation, but then can we integrate that with cover crops and livestock? So we're grazing them back. And can we put some solar panels on our lowest productive lands? And can we package that on a whole farm basis to be able to then provide to the marketplace value saying, look, this is what we can do. And to the distribution, our current agricultural systems don't reward that really much at all. Um, and, and for example, alternative crops, I'll be in meetings with folks and somebody will say, yeah, but there's no market for it. And then I, you know, kind of emperor has no clothes, point out that soybeans don't have a market right now. And then everybody looks at me like I have three heads. But in fact, if you take away all the public support, the public policy support for soybeans, uh, it looks very drastically different. In other words, we're, we're propping up certain crops intentionally through public policy and then saying, well, we can't do that for regenerative agriculture. We can't do that for alternative crops. We can't do that for an integrated approach. And, and so, you know, in 2019, we had 40% of farm income nationally was directly from uh, government programs. So, so the distribution is going to have to be a combination of public policy, smart markets, or you know, smart public policy and 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 competitive, transparent markets, um, and and we know how to do this. Iowa farmers, we develop the ethanol industry on those, you know, three things: farmer innovation, smart public policy, and then participating in markets. So that's the argument that these ecological services have to be integrated in a way that we're using all of those all of those channels farmer innovation public smart public policy and then markets and we have a short time to, to figure this out and the most nimble the most uh creative piece of the puzzle are the family farmers that are still managing their farms you know at whatever scale that is whether it's a few acres or several you know even ten thousand acres we're the ones who, who are really the most important piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to come back to this, the smallholder farmers, based on another question. But first, I want Mark to have the opportunity to speak to uh, ways where Inco or Cargill or some other examples that you might know of 
may be addressing the distribution problem that has been referred to here by both Alden and Matt. Yeah, so thank you. I would kind of dial in on some of the work that Indigo has done. I think one of the biggest problems that Matt rightly points out, both on the public policy front, but also in the realities of the private sector market, is that um, farmers don't get paid for unique agronomic practices. They're not getting rewarded for the special things that they're doing on that farm because they are selling into a system that is a commoditized system, which by its very definition makes it difficult to differentiate anything in it. So for example, if you are selling into a grain elevator that is brick and mortar um, silo based system, all your crop is aggregated in with everyone else's crop and it very quickly loses its traceability. One of the things that Indigo is trying to do um, to enable differentiation in that system is to create digital marketplaces, but we need other innovations so that the crop can move directly from the farm to the ultimate end user for very specific traits through which the farmer gets paid. And one of those traits should be using regenerative farming practices that increase the sustainability of farming and also reduce the effects of climate change. And if we're able to decommoditize the system that way, I think consumers can reliably start putting their money into products that they also know are being raised in a very specific way that have a direct impact, a positive impact in the world that we live in. So you brought up a point about this, this concept of decommoditization. And I do hear that, uh, you know, against some, with some, uh, not in the United States, but, uh, you know, I hear this talk in, in other countries. So it's an interesting question, you know, whether, you know, how, what the impacts are and how to do it. And I recognize Indigo is kind of one of the uh, first examples in the United States trying that at a large scale. And it'll be interesting how that's enabled by technology, you know, with blockchain and all these other opportunities, you know, for labeling and, and you know, I um, have had these pie in the sky conversations with some of my colleagues outside of the United States. And, you know, we always think about um, being able to do a QR code scan on something we want to buy and, and see the soil that it was grown on and perhaps some information on how that soil was managed. You know, as a soil scientist, of course, we might be the only one scanning that particular QR code. But, you know, there's these concepts of, you know, understanding, you know, what exactly is going on with food production. So, but good point. And so I want to circle back now to this question on, um, that is asked by one of the audiences. And the question is, what is the opportunity for carbon farming for enhancing profitability for smallholder farms? Um, I'm not quite sure what a smallholder farm is. They will define it as less than 50 acres. Does that sound reasonable? Um, uh, would somebody like to uh, answer that question? Well, so what is the, so, you know, I think the, uh, another way to think about this is, you know, is, is carbon farming providing the same opportunities for small versus large uh, Farm acreage, you know, there's certainly always the, the multiplier in larger acreages. And, you know, what, what possibly, how, how does this look for the smallholder farmer? I, I think I would do a hand raise if somebody wants to answer this question. Uh, Hugh, are, are you trying to answer your mute is on? Yeah, I, I think um, it's, it's a reasonable question, but I think the other question related to that is how do we take agriculture as it exists today? And that's big agriculture. That's the 90 million acres of corn or the 80 million acres of soybeans or the, you know, 50 million acres of wheat. And how do you turn that acreage, uh, into, uh, a machine that produces better quality soils, produces more food per unit of nutrition um, through practices that meet the criteria that society is asking us to meet. And that's 
how do you reduce the carbon footprint of agriculture? Today, EPA says the carbon footprint's about 10% of greenhouse gases come from agriculture. So what, what practices can we take that, that have a positive impact? How can we improve the soil health so that we get better water management, we don't lose nutrition into the environment? If you look today, 50% of every unit of nitrogen doesn't get used by the plant. So what kind of strategies can reduce that impact? And when we do those things on a broad scale, on a big scale, it has big impact. It has big impact in terms of reduction of greenhouse gases, uh, sequestering carbon, improving soil health, and at the same time, improving the profitability of the farmer. And at the end of the day, if the farmer's not profitable, it's gonna be very hard to implement any practices from the perspective of environment. So, and I think that it's a combination of strategies that will drive that. It will be government strategies. It will be initiatives like Cargill has initiated where they wanna pay people for uh, adopting certain practices that have certain outcomes and it'll be adopting technologies that drive uh, better outcomes. Better nutrient efficiency reduces the carbon footprint of agriculture. Returning organic matter to the soil improves soil health. Those types of strategies will work not only for small farm holdings, but for large farm holdings. And if you wanna have impact, you need to be thinking about what things work for the 10,000 acre farmer or the 30,000 acre farmer that can make sense for him from a production management point of view. Okay. Alden, you had, okay, Matt and then Alden. Okay. Yeah, I just, Sorry. I wanna jump in with that just a little bit. And I think that um, the, the idea that, the idea that the most efficient thing to do is to scale these to the 10,000 or 30,000 acre farmer. Um, I, 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 to me, that, that, that intellectually is a real challenge because what we want to do is we want to, these are management. They're not practices that you check off a list and you, or you buy and implement. These are really creative, um, you know, practices that farmers are figuring out. And if you look at those five practice areas, it's not that industry provided these solutions and then farmers adapted them. It's really like no-till, farmers figured that out. John Deere didn't figure that out. John Deere innovated on top of it, but farmers were the ones who figured it out. Farmers are the ones who figured out rotational grazing and are doing some of the best stuff uh, with nutrient management. Um, so it's, so that idea that, that we have to scale up to large scale in order to, to make an impact really what we want to do is how do we how do we incentivize the innovation whether you're 10,000 acres or whether you're 500 acres and then on so on my 110 acre farm if I've got 110 acres and I'm doing really high level stuff with 110 acres and I'm innovating in a way that's replicable um, and and can change you know not only my farm but can be part of the discussion of changing all of agriculture then that's a really huge that's a much bigger impact than than I than a, a thousand acre farm having the same outcome on a thousand acres that I'm getting on 110, right? So we, we really, the, the unit is not big farm, small farm. The unit is creativity and innovation of the farmer themselves. I think that's a really important point. Um, as you know, I've looked at a lot of this at the policies and obviously soil health, soil management because I'm a soil scientist, you know, that. The real question is how do you drive innovation, right? Because that, that is important. And I think that's gonna get us to our policy conversation. Uh, we have 15 minutes left on this panel and I wanna get have some time for that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Alden, you wanted to say something about the small versus large farm. Are you okay? Yep. I, I can I can I can jam it into the policy conversation. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry about that. That's My okay. apologies. Okay. Um yeah, so, you know, the policy question is, is a good one, you know. So let's think about policy. How does it drive innovation? Um, I don't know if we want to address how policy impacts the, in, the politics. It's probably the other way around. And then, you know, the other part is the, the economics of the situation. And uh, specifically, if we talk about policy, there was this great question for Matt. I think we'll start back with Matt and then go to Alden and, and for some policy comments, because Matt, there's a question for Matt from the panel. It's really fun. It says, if you were the author, what would the key points of a congressional bill that sought to incentivize carbon farming? What key um, components would such a bill have in it? Yeah. Well, 
what, and I've been thinking a little bit about this. What, what I'd like to see right now, essentially, there's some very tiny pieces that people argue about, but for the most part right now, we have the entire federal farm program that doesn't address climate directly, right? I mean, climate change, it directs carbon, it directs resilience to extreme weather. But the idea of unleashing the power of American agriculture to solve the climate change problem, specifically with land use and regenerative agriculture and all of this, it just doesn't exist right now in USDA. So instead of like one piece of legislation to try to, to, to craft something, what I would do is say every aspect of, of every, every farm, pro, every program, conservation, commodity, everything, how could we figure out not that everything has to be carbon or everything has to be climate, but is there a way to, to put climate in that and then farmers that want to innovate can innovate around climate in order to uh, deliver in those programs. So can we, can we integrate on our farm, we integrate equip, uh, CRP, CSP, some wildlife stuff, um, pollinator habitat. I mean, we've, in, we've integrated all of these but when the presidential candidates, because we're the Iowa caucus and we were really engaged in that, when they were coming to our farm, you know, I could say, look, this farm is shovel ready for climate services. And we've used all these public programs to do some really great environmental stuff, but none of it's been focused on climate and we're shovel ready, but none of the programs are focused on that. So if we could just tweak, so when I walk into my, into my county farm, my county office, FSA and NRCS and walk in and say, I'm ready, I'm ready for carbon farming, what do you have for me? That there's actually programs that are directly uh, targeted, you know, language rules that I can walk in and, and work with that office to put together a whole package of, of all of these different practice areas put together. Um, because right now we have little pieces all over the place, but they're not focused and integrated um, in a way that I can use them to do carbon farming. So that would be, you know, that not anything any in specific, but big and broad saying, let's unleash the entire power of farm, uh, federal farm policy to empower farmers like me to, to lead. I can't hear you, Christine. Was I supposed to? <laughs> No, I, I keep putting myself on mute and talking into the mute button. So yeah, please go ahead, Alden. <laughs> um, I, I'll jump out there. Uh, I, I just wanted to touch, and this and this is this relates to policy as well. On the question of the small farmers, we um, are 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 intent on and think we're doing a pretty good job of building the most efficient, most accessible carbon market as possible. And we see our market as one that will be cost effective to enter for the small uh, farmer. I'm talking less than 700 acres uh, in a year or two, but we're not now. And so we work with what we call da data managers, um, uh, entities that, that interact with farmers uh, to, to provide any sort of suite of agronomy or product services who are already collecting data with the farmers to try to integrate our data requirements into theirs so that they're, they're reducing the cost of small farmers coming into our marketplace. It's early days, but it seems to be going very well. Um, speaking not as a farmer, when it comes to educating a farmer, I personally have never met a farmer who's willing to be educated by anyone other than another farmer. So part of the process is trying to find ways to get groups with experience talking in a constructive and friendly way to groups that are seeking to understand that experience. And so we, we, uh, we started a few months ago having um, uh, webinars. Uh, one is for data managers that farmers can go to and another is for farmers just to talk and trade stories. And we're at the point where we, we, we run 60 people from across the country um, sitting in on a webinar. And sometimes, you know, um, people just talk about how you, how you decide when to terminate, you know, for, for, for a whole hour. And it's really good. And, and so um, the question is, how do we foster the dialogue that needs to take place between farmers and isn't about us or outsiders um, telling farmers what to think. On policy, I'll go out in the left field here. Um, I say this with jealousy because I'm a Canadian, but um, 
the United States has the most amazing, wonderful, efficient tax uh, credit mechanism in the world. And I don't know why it's not being applied to this question. And we used to call it the muni municipal bond. It's now the public purpose bond. You know, uh, right now a rural um, uh, 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 local government, county or, or municipal, can issue a bond to raise the fund financing or the funding to reduce, to install um, equipment to reduce emissions in power plants. Um, but they cannot issue a rural uh, municipality, can't issue the same um, municipal bond to raise capital to fund the adoption of regenerative practices in the property tax base on which they rely for, for revenues. The reason your municipal bond is so, so important is because it's efficient in every sector, in every application. The private sector investment, you lever with that, uh, that income, that interest income tax deduction is huge. And more importantly, the thing I love about it most is 95% of muni bonds are held by um, individuals and families and in retirement funds, funds, not by large corporations. So the interest income tax exemption is going to the right people too. So I, I wish there was some discussion about the potential role of public pur purpose or municipal bonds in this discussion, because from a government com commitment perspective, it's asking for very little money where you'll get lots of leverage, where there's lots of experience and the interest uh, income tax exemption is for the most part going to be realized by the right sector of the section or par part of the economy. That's, that's great. Although that's, a, um, that's actually something new I've learned today. So I've heard talk about um, property taxes, but not uh, this concept of, you know, the municipal bonds in our tax policy in that way. So thanks for that. And I think, uh, Mark, I'm going to go to you next and ask you also, you know, your uh, thoughts on policy and small, small, uh, small landholder farmers. Yeah, just quickly. I mean, I think Matt's absolutely right about this. Um, you know, I would share that Indigo, when they announced that they're going to start to pay farmers directly on a per acre basis to adopt regenerative practices, even as uh, probably just as late as late fall, had over 13 million acres of interest expressed online. Um, which involved a fairly um, elaborate you know, application process with no binding commitment, but it showed the potential of interest that's out there. But to really accelerate this, you know, David Perry, the CEO of Indigo has been very public about saying that we're going to need government help to move us in that direction. And I think Alden rightly points out, there's a lot of creative structuring that can happen. And I even think of things like, um, pay for success contracts, something that we used to call social impact bonds, um, but other tax credit or direct payment programs, there's a lot of ways that you can go about it and a lot of room for creativity. But just on the smallholder piece, I think it's very important longer term that we find a solution for smallholders because again, uh, 13 million acres sounds like a lot, but it's a drop in the bucket, you know, globally. And we are facing a, a massive problem in terms of the amount of carbon, excess carbon that's in the atmosphere and in our oceans. Um, and so, you know, so I've worked with smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there are many who are just trying to survive and subsistence farming and any additional incomes dream that you can introduce can really have a dramatic effect. But most important for us to actually be able to the impact we want to, we're going to need to be able to engage them as well. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. So we essentially have uh, five more minutes. Um, and in that, I, I want to include some slides from um, a, the, before we wrap things up. But I, so there's a really interesting question here in the audience that I, um, I, I like. So it's just from a uh, high school science teacher. 
And so this is we're gonna we're gonna back up here to fundamentals panel. And but this is a really good question. I think it's a good way, uh, good discussion to end on. It goes back to the basics. And the question is, doesn't farming basically involve photosynthesis for everything grown? And so what is the difference between normal farming and carbon farming? So this is just like the big picture question. And I think I'll start it off. Um, you, know, uh, you know, when we, she, you know, the, the first part of the question or the comment is correct, right? When we farm, it's certainly using photosynthesis to convert this, you know, the um, energy from the sun into uh, carbon energy that we, we consume. But also with that, you know, with farming, and especially farming that we have today, right, we have a lot of machines, we're burning a lot of fuel to farm. And part of that burning the fuel to farm in more conventional agriculture is disturbing the soil and releasing some of the uh, carbon stored in that soil from photosynthesis, you know, many hundred centuries old and that, uh, is, that carbon is being released to the atmosphere as we um, oxidize the soil and allow microbes, uh, different mechanisms to get at the organic matter that's been stored. Um, so, you know, that's the big picture. You know, with carbon farming, we do want to use photosynthesis, and we just want to change the general direction of where the carbon is going. If you think about the soil surface, we want to use photosynthesis to pump the carbon in. There's a lot of different strategies for that. You know, we talk about um, really deep roots, right? Because the, car the roots are essentially pumping the carbon into the soil. And the deeper they are, the more the carbon is protected from being eaten by microbes or oxi and oxidized. Um, but anyway, I thought this is kind of an interesting philo philosophical spot to land. And I asked re a panel member to show a hand or something if they would like to make a comment Okay, Matt, we'll get the farmer um, about normal farming versus carbon farming. So please take it away. Yeah, I wouldn't pit it against normal farming versus carbon farming. I would say what do we, we've used normal farming to, to accelerate cycles so that we can be more productive with food. Like we're growing things. If we just step back and said, we're just gonna eat from the planet, let nature do its thing, that would be really problematic. We use agriculture, the art and science of agriculture, farmers innovate over 10,000 years to accelerate the processes and the, and the speed at which things are happening so that we actually become more productive. If we step back and just let nature car sequester carbon, we've got a, a prairie in Iowa, about 1,700 acres or something like that of the Neil Smith wildlife. For 30 years, it's been prairie and the carbon levels are not, the, 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 the carbon levels aren't really that increasing very much. So if we just step back and let nature do its thing, then yeah, 10,000 years from now, we could sequester the carbon that we've lost that we've developed in 10,000 years. Carbon farming is using the practice of managing living systems. As a farmer, I'm tasked with how do I accelerate the nutrient cycle, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, do that in a way that actually gets the carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soil faster than it would if I just stepped back and did not. That's carbon farming. We're, pra we're using agriculture to accelerate natural, natural cycles to get to the to the product that we need, and right now, what we need not only food and fiber and fuel is carbon in the, in the you know, carried into our systems. Alden, we'll leave you with the last comment, and then we're going to wrap things up. Just want to put um, a number on the potential there. So, basically, um, soil scientists have a pretty good idea of how much uh, carbon we've pulled out of the topsoil uh, worldwide uh, over the last 300 years with our more intensive food production practices. And there is a consensus that with the adoption of these different practices, we can not only uh, continue to produce food and fiber, but make the soil more resilient and more productive and have the potential to rebuild that soil organic carbon stock back up to the level we knew it was at 300 years ago. If we give ourselves 100 years to build it back up, and if every crop and managed gra gra grassland operator in the United States is uh, adopting practices, not every, if I take 100 years, I'm not getting everybody doing it right away. I'm giving myself for us a, long, a long time to phase land operators in. But if everybody who comes in conservatively conservatively 
sequesters uh, nine tenths or uh, of a ton to a ton CO2 equivalent of, of, of carbon every year. Um, U.S. crop and livestock producers have the capacity to offset three quarters of 100% of U.S. nationwide, all industry, all sectors, and uh, greenhouse gas discharges to the environment. All right. Um, so why would you not be investing in those projects that give you more resilient soil, more productive cropland over time, and it's the least cost, most effective way to offset the nation's emissions. It's, it's crazy that we're not doing it. Okay, thank you, Alden. And you know, I, you know the, her last comment here is that it's crazy that we're not doing it, but I have a list that wraps up uh, what our discussion was today. And you know, I think one of the, a lot of the reasons that we're not doing it have to do with language, you know, how we're communicating. Um, removing the politics of the situation so that everybody feels like they have, you know, um, their, their ideology and, and uh, their desires are, and innovation are represented. Um, innovation, you know, thinking about how we promote innovation, how we handle the needs for changes in our distribution as farmers uh, diversify. Uh, some concepts also for uh, incentivizing and include um, tax policy. And, um, you know, there, we didn't even get into, you know, the moral desires, right? Leave, leave things better than where we started. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of you panelists for the time today. I need to acknowledge the UNC Clean Tech Summit and the Institute for the Environment for providing the opportunity today. And with this, I want to leave us with a slide. I'm going to share my screen. I uh, hope I'm doing that correctly. And this is a slide that was provided to us by the North Carolina um, uh, uh, Environmental Quality Group. Let's see. Well, okay. And uh, this is a report that's going to be coming out soon. And we've just been asked to uh, share this information on some work that is being done. And most important about this slide is in the bottom left-hand corner where we, uh, there is a website that you can go to. Uh, when this, uh, the NC Risk Assessment and Resilience Plan is being um, uh, provided by uh, the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. So with that, I thank you all again for your time. And uh, as those of you that are attending, you will see a email coming to you with the link that has a recording for the panel. So um, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>